Welcome to Excellent Grades Academy. This is Dr. Bison EM. Today we're looking at biochemistry and under biochemistry we're doing proteins. Alright. So, you can register with us at our academy on 0975497790. You can register in all the courses in anatomy, physiology, microbiology and immunology organic chemistry and not forgetting biochemistry all right so let's get into this so we're doing proteins today now the golden question is what are proteins so proteins these are complex biomolecules that are made up that are made up of amino acids so this means that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins amino acids are the building blocks building blocks of proteins so it is very important to know the structure of amino acids to know the characteristics and the properties of amino acids when we are doing proteins so we're going to look at that as this video goes on now let's look at the functions of proteins what are the functions of proteins number one proteins are biological catalysts they are biological catalysts this is to say that they are catalysts. This is to say that they are enzymes. Okay. They are enzymes. They catalyze the rate of chemical reactions. Secondly, they make up body structures. So they make up body structures. Remember, when you are in lower grades, you used to say proteins are bodybuilding foods. So they make up body structures. They are responsible for growth. So for an organism to grow, it requires proteins. Number three, they repair worn out cells. So repair worn out cells. Worn out cells. Meaning that they are functioning in maintenance so they maintain the body structure number four they are a source of energy so proteins are used as a source of energy when carbohydrates and fats are in short supply they are in limited supply then energy are used as a source of energy number five they are also used so five they are you also used in the generation and the conduction of nerve impulses. Generation and conduction of nerve impulses. So in physiology, you've learned about an action potential. So the ones that are responsible for generation and conduction of nerve impulses are proteins. They are also involved in immunity so immunity immune or defense function now question is what proteins are used in defense or immune functions these are immunoglobulins so immunoglobulins these are made by the liver and they are plasma proteins number seven we've got a lot of function of proteins they are used for transport. For example, hemoglobin is a protein that transports gases. So, e.g., hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Number eight, they are used for storage. Storage. Number nine, some proteins are hormones. So, these are hormones in the body. So, those are some of the functions of proteins in the body now let's go further and look at 
the building blocks of proteins which are called amino acids so building blocks of proteins which are amino acids so let's look at the structure of amino acids and the properties of amino acids so an amino acid amino acid okay so amino acids are made up of a carbon that is bonded to a carboxyl group this is a carboxyl group and bonded to an amino group and it is also bonded to an R group which is called an alkyl group and a hydrogen there so this is a general structure for an amino acid this structure can undergo ionization where this acid you know acids are proton donors so it will donate this hydrogen to this nitrogen here which is basic so it will be like this this nitrogen will be attached to three and you know when nitrogen is attached to 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 four atoms it becomes positively charged and the oxygen there will lose the hydrogen so it becomes negatively charged the R group will be here and this will be the h okay so this is the structure of an amino acid this is the structure of an amino acid so under the amino acid what you notice is that this side this group here is an acidic group this is a carboxyl group and then this side the amino group is a basic group so we say that the amino acid contains both basic and acidic parts so because of that we say it is an amphoteric structure amphoteric why it contains both acidic and basic basic groups all right now when it ionizes you notice that it contains both the negative charge here and the positive charge this makes it to be an ion that has got both a basic and a positive both a negative and a positive charge so it is referred to as a sweet a sweeter ion so it is referred to as a sweeter ion so that is an amino acid it is referred to as a sweeter ion one thing also you should notice is that the amino acid is attached to four different groups this carbon here is attached to a carboxyl group this side it's attached to an amino group this side an R group and hydrogen so this carbon here here is said to be a chiral center so it is chiral it is a chiral carbon because it is attached to four different groups except in the first amino acid which is glycine okay so this carbon let me just draw it again this carbon here is attached to different groups sweet ion there the h there and the r this carbon here is attached to four different groups so this is a chiral center meaning that there is rotation that is capable of happening on this chiral center and because the the amino acid uh, has a chiral center we say it has a property of chilarity chilarity meaning that it can exist as isomers so exist as a stereo isomer stereo isomer so amino acid can exist as stereo isomers you can have an L amino acid and a D amino acid this tells us that amino acids can exist as enantiomers enantiomers they can exist as enantiomers enantiomers are just stereo isomers that are mirror images of each other because they they have the property of chilarity so this is very important to know and understand okay so now okay so now 
The simplest amino acid that we know is called glycine. Okay. So the simplest amino acid is the simplest amino acid. Amino acid is glycine. In glycine, this group here, the ara group, is simply so where the ara group is a hydrogen atom. So it's a hydrogen atom. So if you were to draw the structure of glycine, it would be like this. It would be like this, where the ara group would be hydrogen here. So you see, you notice that this carbon here is attached to two hydrogens. So this carbon in glycine is not chiral. It is not chiral meaning that it can't exist as enantiomers. It can't exist as enantiomers. So this is the structure of glycine. What differentiates amino acids is the ara group. So all the amino acids have got different ara groups. All amino acids, acids have different ara groups. Different Ara groups. And the nature of the Ara groups will give the property of that amino acid. Okay. So we've got some Ara groups that are polar, some Ara groups that are nonpolar, some Ara groups that are acidic, some Ara groups that are basic. So all those amino acids that have got Ara groups that are polar are what we call polar amino acids. So now let's look at the properties of amino acids. Properties of amino acids. Properties of amino acids. So the properties of amino acids due to the nature of the ara group, there are some amino acids that are polar, meaning they, their ara groups are charged. So ara groups are charged. They've got charges. E.g., we have got serine. Okay, serine. We've got... Al arginine, arginine, and we've got aspartic acid, aspartic and glutamic acid. So these are some of the polar amino acids. We've got other amino acids that are nonpolar. So meaning that the R groups in those amino acids are not charged. So the R groups are not charged. They are hydrophobic. Examples, we've got valine, valine, alanine, and proline. Others just pronounce it as proline. Other amino acids are acidic. So they've got an acidic side chain. Examples, aspartate. Aspartate is just aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Okay, so are, these are acids because their ara groups are acidic. Basic amino acids, their side groups are basic. These include histidine, so histidine, and lysine. And then we've got amino acids that have an aromatic ring. So their side groups have got a ring. So the side groups are rings. So aromatic rings. So they've got aromatic rings. These include tyrosine, tryptophan, ADC. And then we've got amino acids that have got sulfur in their side chains. Okay. So amino acids that contain sulfur. Sulfur containing. Sulfur containing amino acids. The most common one is cysteine. So cysteine and methionine. We're going to see the importance of these as we go further. Okay. So those are the amino acids. Now, in order for you to make a protein, amino acids need to undergo a reaction that is called condensation. Okay? 
So polymerization of amino acid. Polymerization of amino acids. Polymerization of amino acid is what leads to the formation of a protein. So if you have an amino acid here, okay, so this one here is your amino acid. So that's a carboxyl group. This side, you have this. I will not specify, so I'll just put an R group there. Plus another, another amino acid, you have an N here. It's attached to two H's. Okay, an R group here, hydrogen, and a carboxyl group here. How the condensation reaction is going to take place is that the carboxyl group is going to lose this OH and it will react with this H on the amino group. So the OH and the H will produce a molecule of water. So because water is produced in the process, this reaction is known as a condensation reaction. Condensation reaction. So amino acids will combine in a condensation reaction to form a peptide molecule. Okay. So now what will happen is that amino acid 1 here will combine with this amino acid to form a dipeptide. Because there are two amino acids that are combining, the molecule that is formed is the dipeptide, which is going to look like this. So there's an R group here, an H and then this side, you have an amino group, a C, now combining with this guy here. Okay, so amino acid 1 combined with amino acid 2 using this bond here. This bond that joins amino acids together is what we call a peptide bond. So peptide bond is what we find in proteins. Because two amino acids combine, two amino acids combine, this molecule that is formed is what we call a dipeptide. So dipeptide. Di simply means, simply means two. Di simply means two. So if three amino acids combine, then you have a tripeptide. So three amino acids combining will give you a tripeptide. Tri means three. So up to 25 amino acids, up to 25 amino acids, it will give you a molecule that is called oligopeptide. Oligopeptide. If you have more than 25 amino acid residues, you have what you call a polypeptide. Polypeptide. Now, if a polypeptide, okay, let me just write this down. If a polypeptide has molecular weight that is greater than 10,000 units, then that is what we call a protein. That is what we call a protein. So it's only if a polypeptide has got a molecular weight of more than 10,000, that's when a polypeptide is said to be a protein. Said to be a protein. All right. So that is the, con the condensation of amino acids. That is the condensation of amino acids. Okay, so now let's look at the levels of organizations of proteins after they are formed from amino acids. Levels of organization of proteins. So the first level of organization is what we call primary structure. Primary structure. So primary structure is, this is just a sequence of amino acids. Sequency of amino acids. Amino acids. So where you have, say, amino acid through peptide bond connects to another amino acid, connects to another amino acid. So it's just a sequence. So say this is alanine, this is glutamic acid, aspartate acid, isoleucine, phenylalanine, glutamic acid, glycine. They're just forming a sequence. This is what we call primary structure. 
An example of a primary structure protein is insulin. So insulin co just contains two primary structures. We have a primary structure here, chain, and another primary structure chain here. And these two primary chains will be connected by bonds inside of the insulin, which, is, which are just disulfide bonds. Okay. Disulfide bonds. So disulfide bonds are just bonds where the sulfur in the cysteine will form a covalent bond. That is a disulfide bond. The second level of organization are what we call secondary structures. So secondary structures. Okay. So under secondary structures, we've got two types. We've got an alpha helix, which is a more common, the commonest secondary commonest secondary structure and the second one is the beta pleated sheet the beta pleated sheets okay. so now let's go into detail about the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet so the alpha e helix so it's alpha denoted as this helix alpha helix is where the primary structure will form coils around itself. Okay? These coils are right-handed. The right-handed coils. Handed coils. Now, this coil is maintained by hydrogen bonds. So the coils maintained by hydrogen bonds. By hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds form in such a way that they are the first hydrogen bond, the first amino acid is going to form a hydrogen bond with the fourth amino acid. So these hydrogen bonds are attempt to be N to N plus 4 hydrogen bonds. So if the ever equation comes, the type of amino the type of hydrogen bonds that are in the alpha helix are the N to N plus 4 hydrogen bonds. Okay. An example of an alpha helix is keratin. So keratin is the proteins that forms hair, that forms nails. And another one is collagen. So those are alpha helixes. The second one is the beta pleated sheet beta pleated sheets so the beta pleated sheets is where you have a protein structure here and this protein structure this a protein structure here and there's another protein structure here and then these two protein structures are held together by hydrogen bonds they're held together by hydrogen bonds now how the hydrogen bonds form in a beta pleated sheet is that the 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 carboxyl group. So carboxyl group is what will form forms hydrogen bonds with the amino group. Amino group of another chain. Another chain. What this simply means is that this is one chain, chain one, chain two. The carboxyl group of chain 1 will form a hydrogen bond with the amino group of chain 2. That's how hydrogen bonds are formed in, in, a, in a beta pleated sheet. In a beta pleated sheet. Okay, so now let's go to the third level of protein organization, which is the tertiary structure. So we talked about the primary structure, the secondary st structure. The third level of organization is the tertiary structure. So in the tertiary structure, this is 3D, three-dimensional, dimensional folding of the protein chain. Protein chain. Now you may ask, what are the bonds that are involved in the three-dimensional folding of the protein chain? 
what are the bonds that are involved in the 3D folding of the protein chain. So one bond is called the disulfide bonds. So disulfide bonds. Secondly, we've got the hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. And then we have the hydrophobic interactions. Hydrophobic interactions. And then we have ionic, or they're also known as electrostatic. Electrostatic bonds. Last but not the least are what we call the Van der Waals interactions. Van der Waals interactions. So these are the type of bonds that are found in a tertiary level of organization for a protein. Examples of proteins that are tertiary is myoglobin. Myoglobin is a tertiary level protein. Myoglobin has got about 153 amino acid res residues. So myoglobin which has 153 amino acid residues. This is important information. It might come in your MCQ, so you need to know it. The fourth level of protein organization is the quaternary structure. So quaternary structure. So under the quaternary structure, this is where you have closely packed Closely packed protein chains. Closely packed together protein chains. Protein chains. Now, the bonds that hold these protein chains together are the hydrogen bonds. So, hydrogen bonds. And then you have hydrophobic interactions. Hydrophobic interactions. You have ionic bonds, and then you have the Van der Waals. So never forget these these bonds because they are very important. The Van der Waals bonds. Examples of quaternary structure proteins most important is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. So you need to know that hemoglobin has got four subunits. These subunits are held together by these bonds that we've talked about. Hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, electrostatic or ionic bonds, and Van der Waals. Okay. So hemoglobin has got two alpha subunits. So two alpha subunits. And two beta subunits. So these subunits make up hemoglobin, which is alpha 2, beta 2. Alpha 2, beta 2 hemoglobin. Remember, hemoglobin is a substance that is found in your red blood cell that has got iron and is responsible for gaseous exchange. So it transports gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen in the cells. That is very important. Now, if we look at protein structure, proteins can either be fibrous proteins or they can be globular proteins. Okay. So proteins can be fibrous proteins or globular proteins. Globular proteins. Globular proteins are also known as spheroproteins. Spheroproteins because they are spherical. So they are known as spheroproteins. So now, what are the differences between globular proteins so let me write globular here. Globular proteins this side. And then demarcate them and then put fibrous proteins this side. The differences are very important. This is a potential essay question here. So pay attention and make sure you retain this data. Okay. Okay. So globular proteins are spherical. The polypeptide chains here intertwine 
to form a spherical shape. So these guys have got a spherical shape. Spherical shape. These guys here have got polypeptide chains that are parallel to each other. So they form a fiber. Okay. So because polypeptide chains are parallel to each other. Globular proteins are water soluble. So these are water soluble. Soluble. These are water insoluble. Insoluble. This is the difference. So the other one is that globular proteins have got an irregular amino acid sequence. So irregular amino acid sequence sequence these ones have got a regular amino acid sequence so regular amino acid sequence the other difference is that globular proteins are more sensitive to changes in ph so these are sensitive to changes in temperature and ph these are less sensitive so they are less sensitive to pH and temperature changes. So temperature. Temperature changes. Okay. So mostly globular proteins, these ones have got tertiary and quaternary levels of organization. While Fibrous proteins are secondary proteins, secondary structures. Examples of secondary structures, we already talked about keratin and we talked about collagen. But for fibrous proteins, for globular proteins rather, we talked about myoglobin. So myoglobin and hemoglobin. So your globular proteins function mostly as uh, they function in aspects of metabolism. They are enzymes, they are hormones, they are catalysts, and in storage and, and in transport. But for fibrous proteins, these function in strength and structure. So these make up the structure of the body. So structure of the body and support for the body. So proteins that make up the structure of the body and support the body structurally, those are fibrous proteins. But proteins that function as enzymes and hormones in the body are globular proteins. They are, this is very, very important to know and understand. Very important to know and to understand. All right. Now, one other thing we need to know is that some proteins have got other chemical components that are attached to them. So some proteins have other chemical groups, other chemical components. Such proteins are known as conjugate proteins. So such proteins... are conjugate conjugate proteins they are known as conjugate proteins and the groups the groups that are attached to these proteins are known as prosthetic groups okay. groups are prosthetic prosthetic groups so proteins that have got other chemical com components attached to them other than amino acids are known as conjugate proteins. Proteins that simply have amino acids are known as simple proteins. So simple proteins only consist of amino acids with no other chemical components. chemical components components so it's very important to know this very very important groups now what are some of the examples of uh, prosthetic groups 
so examples of prosthetic groups that can attach to proteins. So prosthetic groups can be, number one, they can be lipids. So if lipids attach to proteins, you form what we call lipoproteins. They can be carbohydrates. If carbohydrates attach to proteins, they can be glycoproteins. Phosphate groups can also be prosthetic groups. Phosphate groups. Other groups can be him and flavin nucleotides. So flavin nucleotides. These are some of the prosthetic groups that can attach to proteins. It's very, very important. Very important to know this. Okay. Now, you know that the, the, the things that make the building blocks of proteins, okay, so the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. Building blocks of proteins are amino acids. In the body, okay, so in the human body, They are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. 20 naturally occurring amino acids. These amino acids are divided into what we call essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are obtained from diet. They are obtained from what you eat, from diet, and are not produced from the body. Are not produced by the body. Okay. So these are nine in number. And then the second group is what we call the non-essential amino acids. Non-essential amino acids, these are produced by the body. Produced by the body. And they are 11 in number. So that, that's a very important piece of information. And you need to know that. Okay? You need to know that. Now, there's one thing that everyone must know, which is called the isoelectric point of amino acids. The isoelectric point of amino acid is the point where the amino acid has got no net charge. So amino acid has no net charge. That is what we call the isoelectric point. Now, in order for you to calculate the isoelectric point, you have to, to have two pKa values. So to calculate the isoelectric point, the isoelectric point, we take the average of two pKa values. The average of two pKa values. So if, for example, we say that glycine has got two pKa values, okay? So example, say glycine has pKa values two point three four and nine point six zero. What is the peak? What is the isoelectric point, which is denoted as the the pi? What is the the pi? So say pi is equals to pKa one plus pKa2 over 2. So the answer here will be 2.34 plus 9.60 over 2, which will give us a value, if we calculate, which will be 5.97. So this is how you find the isoelectric point. It's very important and it comes. So 
we need to know this iso calculation of isoelectric point is very 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 important okay now in our conclusion let's look at the some of the physical properties of proteins physical properties of pro proteins physical properties of proteins so one proteins are colorless colorless and tasteless the reason why proteins are colorless is because amino acids cannot absorb uv light number two the shape of proteins shape of proteins can either be can be globular we talked about this or fibrous that is the shape number three the molecular weight of proteins is between 5 times 10 to the power 3 daltons and 1 exponential to the power 6 daltons that's a that's a molecular weight number 4 they are amphoteric meaning that they are both basic and acidic therefore they can function as buffers can function as very simple buffers number 3 the solubility of proteins is lowest as the isoelectric point. Solubility lowest at isoelectric point. And we've already learned how to calculate the isoelectric point. Okay, so we said that amino acids have got what we call optical activity, which is chilarity. So the optical activity, which is common, is the L isomer. We said amino acids can be enantiomers because of the chiral center. So the L proteins are commonly found. L proteins are common. L proteins are very, very pro common. So those are some of the physical properties of proteins. Physical properties of proteins. So, the last point that we're going to look at is quantitative analysis of proteins. Quantitative analysis of proteins. If you want to analyze proteins, these are the methods that you use. You use the Burette method. Then you use the Bradford assay method. Assay method. If you want to quantitatively analyze, you want to find out how much protein you have in a sample, or you can use the Beer-Lambert equation. So this is for the quantitative analysis. If you want to qualitatively analyze proteins, okay. you use the one-dimensional electrophoresis. So you use electrophoresis. That's one method. There are a lot of types of electrophoresis. You have one directional, dimensional electrophoresis, native electrophoresis, two-dimensional electrophoresis, immunoelectrophoresis, or you can use this method that is called isoelectric focusing. That is if you want to quantitatively analyze your proteins. So this has been proteins. I hope this will prepare you for all the assessments and the exams that is going to come. My name is Dr. Bison EM. See you in the next video when we'll be talking about carbohydrates.